Good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Dunhuang Foundation. I'm Julia Grimes, the Deputy Director. Um, this is our second lecture in the Art, Environment, and Materiality along the Silk Road series. And I'd like to first of all thank Professor Ann Fung at Boston University, who expertly curated the series, as well as Aurelia Docknell, who assisted with organizational details. It's my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Wen Xing Zhou. Wen Xing Zhou is Associate Professor of Art History at Hunter College, City University of New York. Her book, Mount Wutai, Visions of the Sacred Buddhist Mountain, published by Princeton University Press in 2018, examines the inner Asian transformation of the Buddhist pilgrimage site of Mount Wutai in Northern China during the 18th and 19th centuries. Her second book project, Shaping Time, Art of Rebirth in Buddhist Eurasia, explores the visual and material culture of rebirth within the Golupka sphere of influence from the 17th to the 20th century. Professor Zhou's topic this evening will be the art of pilgrimage to Mount Wutai. Without further ado, please join me now in welcoming her. Thank you. So before I begin, I would like to thank uh, the Dunhuang Foundation for the invitation and uh, Professor An Feng, Feng for reaching out to me with uh, a very thought provoking theme for the lecture series. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Dunhuang as an important source of inspiration for me. I had the good fortune um, right after college to work for Professor Sarah Fraser's digital mural project that became the Milan International Dunhuang Archive. Um, it was that time spent in Dunhuang um, to be humbled by the complexity of the worlds, the caves and the wall paintings, and also by the dedication of the local scholars, conservators, mural copiers, who have devoted their whole life to Dunhuang that set me on my path of study. So in my subsequent research, I have not focused on Dunhuang specifically, but I'm hoping that uh, this, uh, this gives me an opportunity uh, that I would like to anchor my lecture today on some uh, materials from the caves, from the Mogao caves, as a way to acknowledge that debt. Um, so in my uh, lecture today, I would like to first give an overview of Mount Wutai, then turn to materials in Dunhuang as a way to reframe a reading of the pictures uh, that will be uh, focused on the Qing Dynasty. So Mount Wutai, just for starters, is located in the present-day Xin Prefecture, Xinzhou of Shanxi Province. Um, it's on the northern end of the Taihang mountain range uh, between the cities of Datong and Taiyuan. Um, so it lies actually just south of the Yemen Pass of the Great Wall, which uh, traditionally demarcated China's northern border. Mount Wutai literally means the five terraced mountains. Um, it's a sprawling expanse rather than a single peak, but it's nonetheless referred to singularly in English as mountain for this uh, historically unitary concept of the site. Uh, the area centers around its namesake, the five terraces or the five uh, plateaued summits, which are respectively, re respectively referred to as Northern, Eastern, Southern, Western and Central terraces. Um, so you can see here um, a view from Central Terrace um, and another one here from the Western Terrace look at, overlooking the Central Terrace. Uh, the, the sort of the very flattened peak terraces called peak, the peaks, flattened peaks, a result from uh, this very unusual, old, unusually old geological formation. It's the oldest land to surface above water in this area. Uh, the elevated terraces uh, are, per are perennially cold and wind windswept um, and are aptly described by the mountain's more ancient name, Clear and Cool Mountains, um, Qingliang Shan, which alludes to Mount Wutai's pre-Buddhist past as a place for immortals and spirits. Even though Wutai is located only 200 miles southwest of Beijing, which is a fairly flat area, the peaks of the mountain range possess the highest altitude in northern China, uh, over, over 10,000 feet. Um, and the exact precinct of Mount Wutai shifted over time, as did the designation of, the, of what the five terraces are. Um, the broader region within and beyond the five terraces cover an area of about 100 or 1,100 square miles. Um, it's 
home to some of the most important monasteries and well-preserved timber architecture in China. Uh, the, the central area inside the terraces alone, an area of roughly uh, is, a, is about an area of roughly 130 square miles, and it still houses over 100 temples today. So the photograph here is a view overlooking the Taihui village uh, at the center of this area inside the terraces. Both historically and today, the entire area is therefore a very heavily built environment. This process of building, especially through monastic architecture, is the topic of uh, Lin Wenzhen's book, Building a Sacred Mountain. It's also something that becomes clear both as a reality and um, a, a reality of the mountain and, reality that, and a reality that is uh, eulogized or promoted when we turn in a few uh, minutes to pictorializations of the mountain. So uh, Buddhist images and scriptures first arrived in China in second, third century from India via the network of trade routes on the Silk Roads. Um, so it may be as early as fifth century uh, that Mount Wutai became uh, recognized as the earthly residence of the Bodhisattva Manjushri, one, one of the most important deities of Mahayana Buddhism. Um, and a figure who is often regarded as an embodiment of wisdom. So you can see in this stone carving uh, from what is present day Bihar, Manjushri hold, holds a sword that dispels all ignorance. And you also see a Nirvana Buddha on the top right um, here as a reminder of the Bodhisattva's future, future enlightenment. We also know Manjushri well from the Vimalakirti Sutra, which became a favorite subject of depiction in Dunhuang, as seen here in Cave 103, where the debate uh, between Manjushri and Vimalakirti on the right frames the entrance of the wall of the cave. From the 6th to the 8th centuries, there were many accounts of visionary encounters with the Bodhisattva on Mount Wutai. And they, these accounts uh, range from a uh, whole host of different occurrences, including miraculous um, appearances of light, uh, such as captured on film here. Uh, and they became sort of, uh, they came to be known and reported and compiled. Um, so combined, those kind of uh, witness accounts, eyewitness accounts, combined with scriptural authorities that prophesized Manjushri's presence there, um, they together legitimized the northern Chinese site as a new cultic center of Buddhism, away from the religion's origins in India. These two passages have been continuously used um, to authenticate Manjushri's presence on Mount Wutai. Um, and these are two of the most well-known and often cited ones, uh, but there are also many others. The first from the Avatamsaka Sutra, um, and I quote here, there's a place in the Northeast called the Clear and Cool Mountains where many bodhisattvas from ancient times have lived. Nowadays, there's a certain bodhisattva by the name of Manjushri who dwells there together with a retinue of 10,000 bodhisattvas and preaches the Dharma. Um, so that's the first passage uh, from um, the Vatamsaka Sutra. The second one comes from an uh, indigenous Chinese text, and I hear that the, I include in the quotation in the kind of back translated Sanskrit title, Manjushri Dharma Ratnagarbha Dharani Sutra. Um, and this uh, provides a little bit more information, uh, slightly different information. And I quote here At that time, the Buddha said to the Vajra wielding guardian Bodhisattva, After I enter Nirvana, the northeastern part of the Jambudvita is a country called Mahachina, Mahasina, where there is a holy mountain called the Five Peaks, in the midst of which the youthful Manjushri roams, dwells, and preached the Dharma for the benefit of all sentient beings. At that time, innumerable gods and the eight classes of beings, together with their retinue, gathered to make offerings. Um, so in time, if you, as you can see in these uh, scriptural passages, the eastward move became both uh, spatial and, and temporal. So Manjushri is now articulated, uh, more so in the second one, as a successor to the Buddhist, to Buddha Shakyamuni after the latter passes into Nirvana. And Mount Utai, the place in this world where the Dharma, where the dharma continues to prevail. So no other deity had been so firmly associated with a single site by different groups of Buddhists all over Asia from such an early period onward and had been so continuously venerated up until the present day. I should say that there are times during this period from, you know, this early period of 6th century, 5th, 6th century that there were 
uh, places that were also recontested as Mount Wutai, but always th this, this was always a place that was associated with Manjushri. Um, so um, Manjushri was, as he still is today, believed to appear to worthy pilgrims in marvelous and unexpected ways. Um, his manifestations were very, um, his apparitions, manifestations were were assiduously recounted in texts and pictures that serve to affirm the scriptures, the, pet, the encounters, and also potentials for future encounters. Pilgrims sub subsequently went to Mount Wutai uh, precisely in the hopes of gaining their own direct experience of Manju Shri. Um, this is very interesting because on the one hand, this maintains a certain level of equity uh, among pilgrims of every background in the sense that there's no telling how and when and who might uh, encounter a man, uh, a, might have an encounter with Manju Shri and how that will take place. But on the other hand, it also allowed the cult of Manju Shri to kind of monopolize the mountain in its every meteorological, environmental and anthropomorphic manifestation. By the eighth century, Mount Wutai rose to prominence as a center for monastic learning, royal patronage, and Pan-Asian Pan -Asian pilgrimage. And it is within this culture of international pilgrimage that pictures of Mount Wutai came into circulation. In the earliest recorded instance uh, in the year 662, the Tang Emperor Gao Zong dispatched an eminent monk from the capital in Chang'an on an inspection tour to, uh, to inspect the sacred traces of Mount Wutai. A painter went along, there was a team, it's recorded there was a team of 10 people, and then the painter made a small scroll or screen called Xiao Zhang, referred to as Xiao Zhang. Um, uh, so that was the first recorded instance. A later record in um, 824 has a Tibetan king sent envoys to the Tang capital to acquire pictures of Mount Wutai. And about, at about around the same time, the Japanese pilgrim monk Enen received a painting of Mount Wutai from his Chinese guide, the monk Yuan, to take back with him to Japan after he visits his visits to Wutai, so that the, his, his visit to Wutai, so that the picture can bring benefit to its viewers who couldn't make the journey to see Manju Shri on Mount Wutai. So the, it's very, made very clear in that story that the pictures serve can serve as a substitute for, for the mountain. So even though we don't have any visual evidence for what these early images look like, I, I think that an important detail in all of these stories is that pictures of Mount Wutai were neither made on the mountain nor by locals, but produced through uh, monastic and imperial and or imperial authorities, either from the capital or the provincial center. And I think this speaks to the question of who has the authority to make such an image, uh, to lay claims to what Mount Wutai is about, and just whose perspective the image uh, represents. And with that question in mind, I would like to turn to paintings of Mount uh, Wutai in Dunhuang, which are some of the earliest surviving pictures that we have uh, from this tradition that we know existed in, in, in this kind of Pan-Asian environment, circulated in this Pan-Asian environment. So there are about seven paintings uh, from, Mugao, from the Mugao caves that scholars have identified as depicting Mount Wutai. They span over uh, from the Tibetan, Tibetan reign, the ninth century to the Guijun period, the 10th century. While most of them are found as screen paintings directly below paintings of Manjushri and entourage as seen on the left here in cave 159, or as part of the backdrop of Manjushri mounted on a lion as seen on the right here in um, Mogao cave 144. Um, they are, th these are, these are, um, there are also several other examples worth noting. These are two other, um, two, two, um, to a print and a painting from the cave, uh, Donghuang Cave 17. On the left, even though there's no representation of, of the mountain, but the, uh, the figure here, Manjushri, is referred to in the inscription below as the Manjushri from Mount Wutai. Um, and on the right here, we have another uh, painting that shows Mount Wutai kind of, it shows it in this kind of uh, bird's eye view, but from a distance uh, where um, you have instead 
um, it's something that's from a distance, but the deity assembly floats in the foreground. Um, in nowhere, but this cave, Cave 61, uh, was the entire stretch of the main register of the West Wall dedicated to Mount Wutai, uh, with a panorama that measured 15.5 uh, meters long and 3.5 meters in, in, in height. And covering the, uh, and, and entire, the entire uh, stretch of the wall here um, is uh, covered with monasteries, retreat caves, memories, of miracles, and numerous traces associated with Manchuria as well as many, many pilgrims and pilgrimage activities. Sponsored by the governor of Dunhuang, Cao Yuanzhong, and his wife, Lady Jai, Cave 61 is one of the largest excavated caves in Dunhuang. Um, and as Sonia Li has shown, the cave also contains one of the most comprehensive and innovative recalling and reassemblaging of existing mural programs. Um, the allotment of the entirety of its back wall to Mount Wutai, the, 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 the main register of it, uh, behind what would have been on the central flat uh, central platform as a, uh, uh, a sculptural assembly of Manjushri riding a lion surrounded by an entourage um, of which we only have now a little lion's tail remaining. Um, literally then brings Manjushri of Mount Wutai to Dunhuang through what uh, Lin Weizhen has argued um, as uh, the creation of a meta monastery, a simulacrum with, without which the mountain could no longer be experienced. Cave 61's mirror of Mount Wutai unprecedented as, as it might be as a pictorial form in some ways contrasting with the ones on the north and south wall of the, of the, um, of the same cave, can still also be seen as a reassemblaging and recalling, perhaps not of other visual paintings, but of existing materials in Zhonghuang. Um, and therefore, I think similar in ingenuity to the reusing of earlier motifs in other walls, Mary Ann Cartelli has convincingly demonstrated an affinity between the mural and the contemporaneous eulogies of Mount Wutai from Wogao Cave 17, in that they serve similar functions of portraying Manjushri's pure abode and the site of his many transformations. Um, I think it's possible that the mural's closest relatives is neither the pilgrimage to the mountain nor other images, but a wealth of se over 70 manuscripts of uh, Mount Wutai found in Dunhuang that included eulogies, songs, praise poem, uh, pra pra prose poems, travel logs, guidebooks, and letters. And I, I put here just one example from the British Library that is a, a, a kind of a pilgrimage uh, to Mount Wutai. There has been no lack of, uh, of, of excellent scholarship on this, uh, on this cave and on this mural specifically. Uh, the director of the Donghuang Academy, Dr. Zhao Shenliang, has uh, done extensive research on deciphering all the cartouches and done extensive, conducted extensive research on each of the, the sites as well. Um, and um, as well as many types of others and many other studies that have approached this mural from different perspectives. What I would like to focus on today here uh, is to take cues from the, the topic of the lecture series, art, environment and materiality along the Silk Roads. Um, to uh, approach it from precisely this environmental perspective. Um, so first of all, if you, if you look very carefully at the, at the mural and here, I'm showing a detail here. Um, it's interesting to kind of think about and note the landscape elements uh, and what they, how they function here. Um, they have, there we have, we're, we see hills, we see plants, flora, fauna. Um, and interestingly, it, they are sort of serving here as some sort of uh, grid or divider or kind of, sort of placeholder for miracles and monasteries. So I, I wanted to kind of think about this a little bit further by comparing it to um, just looking at how 
these uh, sort of so-called landscape elements work elsewhere in the Cape. And what I found is that they seem to do, they seem to look very similar to begin with and perhaps also serve similar purposes. So on the left here is a uh, detail from the Lotus Sutra transformation tableau. And on the right here, a detail from Mount Wutai. And you can see uh, very similar ways in which the trees are rendered, um, beautiful details right here, different types, different, you know, what looks like different types of trees, hills as well. Uh, and, but in some ways they, they look, they structured the landscape in, in very similar ways. Um, so in other words, it's not the hills, trees, or rivers, um, elements that are found in the so-called landscape paintings that speak for Manjushri's numinous presence. It is instead sacred traces, uh, or auspicious appearances, xian, such as you see here, the Buddha's golden foot, um, here and another golden hand, um, here Manjushri appearing as a Taoist sage in white robe, here as a, a, a related appearance of uh, Bhadrapani, um, and here another uh, miraculous appearance of the golden head of the Buddha appearing um, through the cloud, um, and here a Qiling also appearing uh, on the cloud. And so it's these various um, auspicious occurrences that essentially populate this range. Um, and in other words, everything is imposed and, and superimposed onto this land. Um, so here, be it this magically appearing golden bridge or actual monasteries built of timber, or brick tiled mountain gate, or a stone stupa here, or uh, a mountain where uh, the, the feature of the mountain is that the northern, the northern way emperor pierced an arrow through it, or simply uh, human traffic. They have all been introduced to the mountain range through the clearing away of the flora and fauna of uh, indigenous to the land. Johann Alverskog's recent work, The Buddha's Footprint, unravels Buddhism spread through Pan-Buddhist uh, Pan Asia as something uh, akin to European colonialism in its exploitation of the environment, transformation of natural resources into commodity, and the imposition of a new economic system. Um, in this light, the story of Mount Wutai as proudly told through uh, Cave 61 mural can also be seen as one of uh, a narrative about deforestation, urbanization, overbuilding, and overcrowding. You don't see many trees left as they have been cleared away and harvested into timber for the construction of prosperous monasteries that uh, in, throughout this whole mural stand shoulder to shoulder with one another. And I think most importantly, all of this development is endorsed by Manjushri through his miraculous transformations. As uh, you can see here, the Taoist monk, there are also so uh, occurrences of light, emissions of light, um, and the subjugation of local poisonous dragons beneath their pond, along with the subduing of, the clicker doesn't quite work. I don't know why, I'll wait a little bit, but you can see just above this box, the subduing of 500 poisonous dragons. Um, and then on the right here, just a little slow, this uh, dragon king of the ocean also coming to aid. Um, and Manjushri's arrival is accompanied by no less than 10,000 bodhisattva retinues living on the mountain, crowding out the horizon. What of the land, trees, or hills in this fiercely triumphant story of Mount Utai's spiritual landscape? 
Um, the problem I suspect is not that medieval Buddhists were not ecologically sensitive or nature loving, true as that may be, but that we have been, or some of us have been falsely conditioned to associate sacred mountains with our own notions of pristine beauty. Um, I think the question of why that is would um, require a separate talk and would be about John Muir, romanticism and transcendentalism. But for our purpose, purposes here, we can say that in conjunction with that assumption, some of us may also come to expect that a painting of a sacred mountain should eulogize the natural beauty of its flora and fauna, when in reality, what makes Mount Wutai sacred in this particular um, painting is the taming and controlling of local forces and building and populating of the mountain range. Uh, I think the, main, the painting then in many ways pictorialized uh, but more heavy handedly what both Raoul Verbang and James Robson have characterized, characterized as the ways in which Buddhists, uh, Chinese Buddhists, uh, Mount Wutai and elsewhere fashioned holy territories from pre existing place of practice. So now, with that in mind, I would like to return to the initial scriptural passages that justified uh, Mount Wutai's uh, sanctity. And we can see that um, it is also, you know, within that light, it's also about Manjushri and ret retinues literally taking over the mountain's past and present. Um, and so it is with this sensitivity toward the negotiation between the Manjushri cult and the local environment or landscape that I would like to now turn to later pictures of Mount Wutai uh, during a time when the mountain was radically transformed into a Tibetan and especially Gelugpa Buddhist site under the patronage of the Manchu Qing emperors. In the case of the Qing dynasty, uh, so the question becomes, um, how does one, um, or how, how in, in terms of image making, occupy and transform a landscape that is as highly developed and fully populated as Mount Wutai? So first, just a few words about this history. Tibetan Buddhism Mount Mount Wutai was first established um, during the Yuan dynasty when Mongol emperors invited Buddhist ritual masters uh, from Tibet to the mountain. The Yuan imperial government ordered constructions of both uh, uh, Chinese and Tibetan monasteries, including uh, the great white stupa by the Nepalese artist Ange, um, and which you see here um, pictured. Um, it's, it's striking new Himalayan architectural form proclaims a distinct Mongol Yuan imperial authority. Towering over the entire Taihuai Valley, it remains the most iconic monument of the mountain today. The ensuing centuries witnessed a steady increase of inner Asians on the mountain, but up until the 17th century, there were little exchange between Tibetan and Chinese canonical discourses on the mountain. Um, so the mountain that I think, it, well, the Mount Wutai that existed in Tibetan art and literature up until this point emphasized instead a, a more abstract cosmo I would call a cosmo topographical vision of the mountain that is, uh, that is in fact well preserved also into later periods. Um, so examples can be found in the illuminated manuscripts of the White Barrow, a Tibetan astrological text authored by the regent Sangi Gyatso, um, which you see on the left, and in the wall paintings of the Samya Monastery in central Tibet, uh, which you see on the right. So uh, in, in both of these pictures, I just have one detail here, we have uh, five symmetrically configured peaks, each topped with a manifestation of Manjushri, uh, presiding over an, a kind of what looks like an enchanted Buddhist paradise filled with blossoming trees, frolicking animals, and gushing waterfalls, uh, sort of impervious to kind of a, a historical transformation. Now, in the Qing dynasty, Mount Wutai flourished into a center of Tibetan Buddhist pilgrimage and monasticism. Um, the early Manchu emperors who, who fashioned themselves as kingly emanations of Manjushri promoted Mount Wutai through the production of mountain gazetteers, imperial tours of the mountain, and patronage of its monasteries. 
This tanka from the Freer Gallery of the National Museum of Asian Art at the Smithsonian portrays Qianlong as an emanation of Manju Shui, a wheel, uh, sorry, emanation of a wheel turning king in Manju Shui, Manju Shui Chakra Rartan, uh, flanked by a sword and a book, which are uh, denotes, which uh, refers to that identity and holding a drilled, jeweled wheel of law um, and in this larger, in the entire picture, he's uh, encircled by kind of a pantheon of, of divinities. As a result of the Qing support of the Gelugpa monastic order of Tibetan Buddhism, monks and pilgrims from Tibet and Mongolia populated the mountain. Um, their presence continued in the night into the um, into the 19th century, even as imperial support waned, um, and earning Mount Wutai the appellation uh, at the beginning of the 19th century as, quote, China's Tibet. In some ways, uh, Mount Wutai's Bo Tibetan Buddhist transformation is nowhere more evident than on this uh, panoramic hand-colored print on linen, uh, now in the National Museum of Finland in Helsinki. I I'll turn in a second to many other versions, but I wanted to start with, for simplicity's sake, start with one, one, one of the iterations here. This image measures uh, a hefty six foot wide and contains uh, over 150 sites in a mountain range that is filled with travelers, monasteries, festivities, flora and fauna, and cloud-born deities. Uh, I think in, in so many different ways, this uh, picture, this print, recalls uh, the elements in Cave 61, but as we'll see in a second, they're also very different and distinct in the way that they're made. So the sites and miracles depicted, uh, but for starters, the site and miracles depicted on this map are predominantly associated with the Gelugpa school of Tibetan Buddhism. So here we don't see any more this uh, Taoist sage in white robes, um, but various Tibetan esoteric deities that are now mapped onto the, the five peaks here, not working again, but also all throughout the landscape. So as we meant, as I mentioned earlier, visionary encounters is a very central, is very central, it's sort of defining feature of the cult of Manju Shri on Mount Wutai. But it is also uh, central to uh, narratives in, in Tibetan Buddhism, as teachings were often transmitted by visionary interactions between teachers and students. Um, and, um, and, 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 and so, for example, Tsongkhapa, the founder of the Geluk sect of Tibetan Buddhism in the late uh, 14th century, is said to have reformed Tibetan Buddhism through teachings that he had received from his teacher Manjushri in repeated visions. Um, five visions, and we'll see that becomes important. So canonical Galuk history has it that after Tsongkhapa had passed away, he in turn passed his teachings on by appearing in a series of visions to his, uh, series of visions to his disciple Kejukje. And so returning now to this map, the five peaks on, on the map, uh, you can see details here, each are uh, topped with a yellow roof, yellow roof signifying imperial temple. Uh, and each has an image of Manjushri inside. Um, it turns out that the five Manjushri inside the uh, terrace topped temples and the five other deity emanations that are hovering above each of the five temples on the cloud are closely associated and directly referring to the transmission of teachings from Manjushri to Tsongkhapa and from Tsongkhapa to Kejukje. So um, um, the ones inside the temples that, are, that you see here, iconographically then can be mapped out to the five uh, re re revelations of Manjushri to Tsongkhapa when um, Manjushri transmitted his teaching to Tsongkhapa. 
the five figures that hover above each of the five temples are also none other than Tsongkhapa's five apparitions to his chief, to his chief disciple, Kedrup J. Um, and um, uh, when, um, to after that he has passed on to uh, his Kedrup J after he passed away through visionary uh, transmission. Um, so here on the right is a uh, tanka from the uh, Asian Art Museum, San Francisco, that shows uh, this very familiar rep representation of, um, uh, you, you often see him depicted in these visions, and you can see this is Kedrup J uh, below, kneeling um, uh, with an offering to uh, making offer to this manifestation of Manjushri that was in fact uh, um, Tsongkhapa appearing to him. So, um, so here Tsongkhapa receives a vision, uh, Tukhiri Drupje receives a vision of Tsongkhapa appearing as an emanation of Manjushri riding on a lion. Um, and, and so the same, the same uh, thing you are seeing here where K Drup J is now kneeling at the entrance to the north the southern uh, top terrace top mountain um, receiving a vision of Tsongkhapa as Manjushri. And here's another um, on another peak here uh, we have another version of that. Um, where you, we have uh, Tsongkhapa appearing in a different guise. Um, as, a, as the great Indian adept Gombi Haruka to K. J. And you can see this is also this tanka from also from the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. Uh, it, it, that's that's the standard ways in which these tanka, uh, the standard iconography. But here on the map of Mount Wutai, um, it becomes mapped onto that mountain. So that connection was made, in other words, for the first time in the mapping of Mount Wutai, of the connection between the, the reception of these visions um, and, their to, and then tying them to the five peaks. Uh, neither Tsongkhapa nor K. Jibje had ever been to Mount Wutai, at least not in their lifetime, right? Or, uh, you know, so sort of uh, in this kind of, in their, in their regular body, um, but, and, and the revelatory episodes depicted here, uh, according to these biographies, would have taken place in Eastern and Central Tibet, where the two were respectively. Um, but as it turns out, stories about their secret presence on Mount Utai began to circulate within the Galupa uh, tradition, beginning in around the early 19th century. So around the time that this, this map was made. Um, and so they are, in, and in this map, they are the, the episodes of these visionary encounters are mapped onto the five peaks directly uh, and paired, where, and they're paired with the forms of Manjushri, uh, the, the five forms of, Man, of Manjushri appearing to Tsongkhapa and the five forms Tsongkhapa appearing to Chaitrupje are respectively mapped onto the mountain in pairs. Um, and, and they illustrate the ways in which uh, sort of lives of spiritual masters, like physical landmarks, come to define a holy landscape, uh, even when the narratives originally took place elsewhere. Um, it should come as no surprise that even deity Manjushri is being remapped in a particular Galukpa cosmological formulation uh, that topographically aligned with the five peaks. Um, they affirm in this instance, the chain of transmission of teachings from Manjushri and the role of visionary episodes within this tradition. So there are many, I won't go into the details of the various, I wanted to give an example of the kind of mapping that happens. Besides uh, the sort of mapping of visions, there are also other aspects of the team transformation that have to do with the, uh, that, that have to do with the renewal of trope, of the trope of imperial subjugation that we had already seen also in cave 61. So here is uh, the Kanxi emperor, seeing as 
pacifying um, in the more mountainous region of Mount Wutai, pacifying, uh, pacifying a ferocious tiger, um, a, a story that resonates deeply with Wutai's former um, imperial sponsorships, and also with Bodhisattva Manjushri as someone who subdues local ferocious deities, uh, local ferocious um, spirits or animals. A similar kind of remapping also happens uh, to the built environment as well. So here is the yellow, uh, a yellow, a very large yellow roofed monastery, uh, monastery just just to the left of the map, and it represents uh, what is known as the Bodhisattva's Peak or Pusading, uh, which has been the unchanged uh, center of worship and imperial sponsorship since the Tang Dynasty. Uh, However, the Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva's Peak, the name of the monastery, um, became a chief Gelugpa monastery uh, by the early Qing dynasty. It was extensively renovated into an official imperial establishment. Um, uh, with, and so that's accorded here. Actually, the color coding here is very important. The, the only imperial establishment can be accorded with yellow glazed tiles. Um, and here, the, the establishment was also uh, used to house Wu Taishan's Jasak Lamas, uh, which were, who were the highest religious official of the mountain. And they were often appointed from a pool of, of lamas from Tibet. Uh, the monastery, I don't know if you can see the detail here, maybe this is better, uh, also included in the back, and you can see here actually, this is the part that's not completely um, uh, colored in gold here, but still an extension of the monastery, uh, probably referring to the uh, uh, residence of the Jasak Lama, but there's also in the back here an imperial traveling palace for the visiting Manchu emperors. We, we have historical records that during the Qianlong reign, Bodhisattva's peak housed approximately one third of the 3000 lamas um, that were residing on Mount Wutai. And these are lamas from Tibet, Mongol, a lot of Mongol, Mongol lamas, Manchu lamas, and also uh, Han uh, Chinese, but uh, Tibetan Buddhist lamas that were residing on Mount Wutai. So it's a, it was a, very busy place and a very important a, a sort of major place, uh, both of worship and also of kind of mon monastic power. Uh, here on this detail here, you can see a Maitreya procession. Oh, here I just wanted to show you an, also an early map from the early 1920s of the main hall of um, Bodhisattva's Peak. In this detail here, you can see that uh, not only is there the architecture that's very prominently displayed, but there's also a procession, a Maitreya procession that's winding down um, and a Chang ritual that's uh, descending, uh, descending from the peak, from Bodhisattva's peak and winding down to the mountain's uh, most prominent landmark um, of the white, uh, the great white stupa that was first built in the Yuan dynasty. Returning to uh, uh, looking at the various um, titles and inscriptions and colophones of this map uh, gives us a little bit of a sense of what the perspective is. So a trilingual title, the panoramic picture of the sacred realm of the mountain of five terraces is written on the top here in Tibetan, uh, Chinese, and Mongolian. Um, and they, the whole thing runs across the top register of the composition. And another trilingual donative inscription at the bottom of the composition uh, details the purpose of the mapping project, which we'll get to in a little bit. So according to the inscription on the top, the blocks were carved uh, in 1846 at Mount Wutai's um, Cifu Monastery, or Monastery of ben Benevolent Virtues, uh, by a resident lama named Lundrup, who has come to reside on Mount Wutai from a monastery in Orga uh, in the present day Rep Republic of Mongolia. Um, the colophon also instructs that the block panel be kept at 
the monastery of benevolent virtuals, Sifu Si. Um, so it turns out the temple, the, 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 the temple where the woodblock was carved was built only about 30 years before this, uh, this undertaking. So a fairly new monastery in a mountain full of, of, of very old um, sites. Um, and also on this map, it's very prominently displayed just to the right of the center dividing line. You can see there's a big crease and also where the wood, there are different pieces of wood were joined. Um, and so in this position, that very well counterbalances with uh, the Bodhisattva's peak um, and, dis and in fact disrupting uh, the Bodhisattva's peak's position on the central axis of virtually all pictures of Mount Wutai since cave 61. So there are many other images I won't bring here, but I just wanted to return us here to see how this, this is, the monastery was known by a different name at the time, but it's basically the same site. Uh, and it's very much the, the centrality of this, um, of this temple it is plays a very important sort of compositional role here to anchor the 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 the, uh, the symmetry of the of the of the map of the map mural. In in the donative inscription below, um, the carver Lundrup speaks to the use of the map as a surrogate for the experience of the pilgrimage to the mountain. It's very detailed too. So the, there, the, lang the three languages vary slightly in the Tibetan and Mongolian inscriptions, which parallel each other. They stress the efficacy of coming into sensory contact with the map through seeing, through I quote, seeing, hearing, touching, and remembering, end of quote, as means to receive the Bodhisattva's blessing. blessing. The Chinese version, which I have um, uh, translated here as well, uh, is, uh, identifies in greater detail the benefit of both seeing the map and of making pilgrimage to Mount Wutai. Um, you can see here, um, benefactors everywhere who make pilgrimage to the sacred realm of the clear and cool, who view this picture of the mountain in order to listen to and recount the numinous efficacy and wondrous dharma of the Bodhisattva, while in this life be free from all calamities and diseases, enjoy boundless blessing, happiness, and longevity. After this life, they'll be reborn in the land of fortune. All this are received through reliance upon the Bodhisattva's compassionate transformations. Um, and so the, and here, so, and, and here, that these are kind of the benefit that you can have. But on, in the second part of the inscription, there's also the uh, mentioning that uh, the carver named Lundrup from Sangim Aimak make a great vow to carve this woodblock with his own hand in order to extend to benefactors of the four directions. Should a person make the vow to print this image, they will accumulate measurable merit. Um, so it emphasizes not only the efficacy of, you know, seeing the image and then making pilgrimage to Mount Wutai, but also the immeasurable merit that can be accrued by printing the map, printing and sort of distributing the map. Um, and so while all three languages, uh, the inscriptions in all three languages stress the efficacy of the picture and its capacity to stand in for the actual mountain, as far as receiving blessings are concerned. Um, in the Chinese version, the added benefit of disseminating the map is highlighted. So true to its aspiration, in fact, uh, the, while the woodblock panel uh, indeed remain kept at the monastery, um, the Sifu monastery, until the early part of the 20th century. Its prints were hand-colored, collected, sold by artisans and merchants, gifted to patrons, and widely circulated around the globe. Um, so uh, so the, the, hand, the print that we, we started with here is among numerous prints from the sand wood block panel that are found in collections around the world. Um, so here are 
four other examples. I have like a whole collection of them, uh, but I think it's just to give you a sample of how they are, they become, they take on a life of their, of, of their, of their uh, they, they, take, they each take on a, a different life of its own. And um, through this kind of difference in their coloring schemes, their style of coloration, but also difference in the way that they interpret the various sites and miracles and figures and narratives. Um, and importantly, in their eventual display and use. Um, and um, so such that such as if you were to learn about Mount Wutai through two differently colored print, you may see very two very different mountains. So this impression is one of the most uh, just uh, really beautiful a uh, copy of this now in the Rubin Museum of Art um, is, I think also, it's wonderful both in terms of, you know, what the color, colorers did to the print, but also what, what ended up happening to the, to the print as it was colored and mounted with layers of brocade and probably hung as a tanka painting uh, from the time that it was first printed and colored. While you can see some of these other examples, this one, the one from the Library of Congress on the right, for example, and also the Helsinki print, we have, um, um, uh, they both exhibit multiple traces of creases, uh, so indicating that they were folded up for prolonged periods of time and may have been stored in, say, a pilgrim's amulet box when they went on pilgrimage. Um, and so you see, in terms of there's, you know, so many things happened from the time that they were printed that they, they you can really see the, the, through their physical condition, the handling of the map, this very divergent use of the map by different people. Um, and um, so here we have the range from, you know, an image of the holy mountain to be venerated on the left from the Rubin Museum of Art um, uh, to something that is still venerated, but have but used as a kind of guide. So you can imagine the various uses of it as a, as a guide, as an image to be venerated, as a surrogate for the mountain itself, um, and, and any number of them, in fact. And so moreover, not only do we have um, many, many, many prints of this, I think I have about, I, I tell you about 20 of them uh, from around the world, there are also many uh, later paintings in, uh, in different media that are based to different degrees on um, the original composition. Um, and and those pro these copies uh, present yet more different choices um, of, of what to include and what to interpret and what to leave out. So for example, in this painting mounted on a hand scroll. It's pretty, it's pretty large, but it's mounted on the hand scroll. Uh, all of the cloud-born deity apparitions are gone, as have all the, the lamas in procession, or for that matter, any humans or animal presence at all. Uh, so that we're just left with the buildings and the landscape elements a little bit more enhanced. And you know, there's paintings of clouds cre creeping in um, and more detailed attention to the sort of uh, the, the way the hill, the contours of the hills um, and the sort of jagged peaks. Um, and, and so very interesting choice in the sense that it stripes, it uh, strips the original print of any overt Tibetan Buddhist flavor. Um, so there are still inscriptions now, they're all in Chinese. I think I forgot to mention that in the original map here in all of these vision, versions in the woodblock prints, uh, each of the one, the reason why we know that there are about 150 sites included is because each of them have a detailed bilingual inscription next to each site in Chinese and Tibetan. And so here in this kind of uh, version, it's, it's uh, not only are all the sort of overt Tibetan Buddhist elements stripped away, you also only have the, the Chinese, the inscription in the Chinese cart, uh, with, with the Chinese in the cartouches. Here's another sort of hypersaturated copy now in the Hermitage. Um, and here is another very interesting example of a wall painting in the 13th Dalai Lama's audience hall in the Potala Palace in Lhasa. Um, 
that seems to have kept especially was was especially keen on keeping the various manifestations of Manjushri. So this was by all account a global image, uh, not only in the sense that it traveled the world, but also in the sense, global in the sense that it was highly accessible and appealed to an audience across broad social cultural spectra uh, from European colonial agents who were collecting map and were interested in it to Tibetan rulers, uh, to everyday pilgrims on the mountain itself. Up until the first half of the 20th century, prints were still made and sometimes they were made on paper that were distributed to by the temple to its donors, uh, people who donated money to them, made offerings as a kind of, of, of token of appreciation. Um, they were also printed on linen, still colored, and sewed at shops. Um, and also, some of them were just on purchased as uncolored black prints. So we still have many, um, we, we have still many, there are many these of these uncolored uh, prints that still that circulated widely as well. So there's like different love you can you can get this acquire this image at its various different stages and levels and also you know associated with that sort of economically right so you can you with you can have a very expensive mounted on brocade venerated image of a tanka acquire you can acquire that or you could have a simple uh uh Black print printed on paper that had that was distributed by the monastery. Um, so it's, I think it was also quite remarkable when I first brought this Xerox and taped together. It's a much small. What you see on this photograph is a much smaller version of the map because I was I brought this map as a photocopy of, uh, of what I found in a Helsinki print publication. Uh, this Helsinki uh, a publication of the Helsinki print. So when I first brought this um, print back to Mount Utai, the map had been mostly, in fact, forgotten on the mountain. Um, uh, although apparently not, it's the sacred topography that it maps out, which is what uh, I think explains this very visible excitement here. Um, so I believe the map became a particularly widespread source of influence because of its originality. Um, the map was created from the map maker's firsthand knowledge of the mountain, um, not based on the earlier pictorial model or textual source. Uh, so unlike Cave 61 mural that is largely largely uh, topological, meaning it can stretch and bend and uh, as an interconnected set of sites to fit into the pictorial surface. Um, in contrast to that, the woodblock print corresponds so well to the topography of the area with so many details not seen in, in any other extant materials, uh, both textual and visual sources, that I think it had to have been created from from experience. Um, so from the delineation of the precise number of bays and halls of temples uh, to the inclusion of otherwise little known hamlets and villages and even some sort of obscure deities around the mountain to the lively and often very humorous depictions of popular pilgrimage activities and local legends, uh, elements of the map display this very intimate knowledge of Mount Wutai uh, from, from a unique perspective of the map maker, map maker, one that is eminently usable as a guide um, and, uh, and can also be offered up as a template for further interpretation. Um, and as such, also it is, serves as a kind of very complete and comprehensive substitute for the original mountain. So I think the fact that it can be used as a guide, it's that um, complete and uh, navigable that makes it also more, gives it a kind of desirable quality as a substitute for if you can't travel to the mountain. Um, so the extraordinary lives and afterlives of this image complicates the question posed by the earliest anecdotes of Mount Wutai pictures from the 7th and 18th, 8th century, uh, the question of just who has the knowledge and authority to make and propagate their vision of the mountain. Uh, prints and later copies of the 19th century map uh, reflects at once the authority of the carver uh, and its openness to further individuation at the hand of 
colors and copiers. Um, so perhaps this is this continuous and collective um, process of repetition in the individuation can be compared to the layered process of ritual enactment, such as seeing in the center of the map. So here you can see groups of musicians and dancers, especially nice, uh, well uh, colored here in this Reuben print, uh, dressed and masked in, as various deities and protectors performing a ritual dance known as Cham Dance. Um, Cham Dance came to Mount Wutai from Tibet by way of Mongolia during the 17th century and was held annually at the mountain up until the Cultural Revolution and has been revived in recent years. And I see some pictures of this um, as a kind of important tourist attraction as well. Um, the presence of Cham, uh, followed by a deity procession above, embodies the process of negotiation between culture and religious traditions, past and presence, present, as recorded by Jobu Hibino based on his own 1940 trip. Local Taoist deities were added to an already long list of gods and non-Buddhist pasts that were incorporated earlier on in Tibet and Mongolia. So in other words, its collection of deities clearly recalls the history, historical itinerary, uh, much like the juxtaposition of, of the Tsifu temple, the temple where the carving was made and the Bodhisattva's peak. Uh, but this time in the sphere of the divinities, the Cham dance parades a new pantheon of Mount Wutai's gods and protectors that extends far into Tibet and Mongolian history and deep into Wutai's own local and pre-Buddhist heritage. Its depiction in the center register of the woodblock print in turn both reaffirms and documents this contemporary festive, uh, uh, contemporary festive spectacle's permanence in an inseparability from Mount Wutai's landscape. The singular appearance of Cham in the center of a map of Mount Wutai has come to define and continuously reiterate the mountain's conversion to this new version of Tibetan Buddhism and very poss possibly contributed to its recent revival on the mountain. So in this sense, both the reception of the map and the engagement with the mountain continues to evolve in relation to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Wenxing, for that extraordinary presentation. Um, just to like elucidating the layers of representation and um, the actual performed ritual on the mountain itself. It's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, we have questions pouring in. <laughs> so I'm going to start with some of those. Um, the first is your thoughts on the occupation of Mount Wutai are very interesting. Are the 10,000 bodhisattvas cosmic or physical um, in that, you know, do they actually impose on the environment? Hmm. Okay. Let me go back to the share screen mode. So uh, let me see. Let's go. Sorry, I jumped out again. Yeah, that's inter that's an interesting question. I would say they're physical on the on the map on the on the mural, <laughs> and that they're there, and that's the level in which we can think about them existing on that surface. But of course, the ten thousand. Uh, retinue is also mentioned in a, a variety of textual sources as well. Um, and so um, let's see, I wanted to just go there. So yeah, so I think it's an understanding that they are that they are they have come here to attend to the teachings of Manjushri, um, and so that understanding can be interpreted. I think maybe if, if the question is asking whether they are causing any kind of physical change to the landscape, then I guess that question to that the, the, that question is no. But I think that understanding uh, and the sort of um, I, I think what I was trying to say is that that sense of them populating the mountain as something that is both triumphant and desirable is right. a kind of narrative trope that I see as as uh, as, as as rooting for this um, uh, as privileging that that uh, um, that narrative of development. Um, and, and of course, there are also other kind of perhaps signs and indications that could be physical that could 
indicate or confirm their presence. I, I think to answer that question, I'd have to read and read more of these early texts in this within the slide to kind of think about the correspondence between mentioning of this idea of 10,000 retinues and any kind of physical alteration that is recorded as happening on Mount Wutai at the time. Excellent, that would thank be you. Um, our second question is, just to be clear, the images of Wu Taishan are all reproductions from the same woodblock carving, and then they're hand colored, or something else like another process? Yeah, thank you for the clarification. It's actually, so everyone that I've shown here of the four copies, and I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to, for sake of clarity, I'm going to leave us in this, uh, in this share screen mode. I'm sure if I can enlarge this a little bit. One second, sorry. Oh, there it is. Well, no worry. <laughs> so all four <coughs> excuse me, are from the sand wood block, right. but there are other copies that are based in um, on, on later recarvings that are okay. slightly different. And of, of course, these other examples here in different media are just their own thing, but they're based on the composition. They're obviously based on someone who has, who didn't come up with this image on their own, but, but saw a print and uh, sort of, um, you know, made their image of Mount Wutai based on this print. So it's like a living so, memory of the so, structure. Yeah, it's sort of like the skeleton or the schema like people go to when they from, you know, this was carved in uh, 1846. I think all subsequent paintings of, yeah, it's like a living memory. It's something you reference and right. in different ways. So I think the, the question that Kim also wanted to clarify how, so so there are, th these are all wood blocks that were hand colors. I have never seen one where you would have a printed color. I don't think you, so this is the, the process is just this xylograph that you, you then hand color. Um, okay. So yeah, does that, I hope that clarifies the, the question. I think so, but if not, please let us know. You can right. always write in with feedback. So our next question is, do we have knowledge of foreign travelers on the Silk Road from Dunhuang to Mount Wutai in, found in manuscripts or other artworks? Well, it depends on what you define as foreign. <laughs> uh, there, yeah, so there are definitely, yeah, there are records. Uh, definitely, we have lots of records of different travelers, also Southeast Asia. Um, was the question about Dunhuang or just in general? I, can't, I already can't remember. Did you click travelers from travelers Dunhuang. from Dunhuang? Yeah, so there are definitely so, yeah, so this, 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 uh, this, uh, oh, sorry. This scroll I showed here was a kind of a, a kind of a pilgrimage to Mount Wutai, presumably brought from someone from Doha. Mm. Yeah. So, and then there are also manuscripts in Tibetan that were written about Doha and Doha pilgrimage. So, yes. All right. Thank you, Wenjing. So, um, our next question uh, starts with a compliment. Excellent lecture. Thank you. Why don't we have more visual sources of Mount Wutai between mm. the 7th century Mughal caves and then mm -hmm. starting again in the 17th to 18th century? Mm -hmm. Do you think a revival was done? Mm -hmm. Was that on the, beh the behest of some Tibetan or Mongolian priests mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. sojourned yeah. at Mount Wutai? So I think statistically, we just have a lot more things from the 19th century in general. I, I don't know the question to this answer, but I have searched deep and wide for pictures of Mount Wutai to know that there are many records of Mount Wutai paintings from earlier periods, but we haven't, I don't have actual copies. And I think that indicates mm -hmm. that, yes, of course, there's a kind of burgeoning of interest on the sort of Tibetan Buddhist front and this kind of circulation of pilgrim, people increased travel and interest and in knowing in both traveling to and knowledge about Mount Wutai that actually definitely, we definitely see a, a kind of uptick. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that the, the fact that we don't have anything between the 10th century and uh, I don't know, 19th or 18th century doesn't mean they didn't exist at all. Uh, it's just that they don't survive. A lot of them, we have records of them being painted onto walls of monasteries um, and things like that. So, um, and then there are also paintings of Mount Wutai, not necessarily in this kind of icon, in this kind of, as a kind of sacred icon to be venerated from other periods. Um, but the, the, yeah, so I think 
there are two things going on. One is that definitely we have with this map, this, this map really caught on, it kind of became a, you know, somebody, it was like a, it was a big project that only this person could do. And I, I have the backstory included in some of the writings I've done uh, that kind of shows, or the sort of purported backstory that shows what a, what a, what a unprecedented task it is. But I think just looking at the image itself and kind of understanding the logic of it, you know how, how much it took to create that image. Image. And so once that was created as a template, it was then easy to, in a way, imitate it. And so, and also the image really served a lot of purposes. So in that sense, it circulated really widely. Um, I think on account of this kind of the richness of that project, that the painting of uh, Mount Wutai became kind of revived. Uh, but that doesn't mean they didn't exist earlier at all. We just don't know what they look like between Dunhuang and, and, and what we have here. Um, but they certainly existed and they certainly circulated. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's important to realize Dunhuang is an anomaly. Like the fact that those things yeah. survive, those yeah. objects and paintings, it's because it's in the desert. It's so dry. Almost nobody got out there on a regular basis right, right. And after a certain period. Right. And the manuscripts that has such a wealth of information about travel to to Mount Wutai, right? So that's again just another notch, another another notch higher in terms of how incredibly um, sort of. Uh, uh, um, unprecedented, uh, sort of unusual it is that they were kept, they, were, they survived, yeah. All right, so our next question is actually from Anne. Thank you, Wenxing, for such a rich talk. I've heard there were pilgrimage-related large prints of other famous mountains from the late imperial period. Was this a type of practice that was widespread mm. during this period? There mm. have been more recent studies of maps and sacred sites in Edo, Japan, do you think there's some potential in having more studies of large print imagery and mountain sites in Ming and Qing China? Mm. Thank you for that suggestion. And I, yeah, I think absolutely. Um, the yeah, I think kind of having this kind of this late imperial period, uh, in, in the way your question gets at it from a different pers a different angle than the previous. Uh, question as well and thinking about what is particular about this period. Uh, I wonder what you were thinking about the other famous mountains. I do have, yes, I, I would love to, I think maybe talk with you more and think about this issue of the format of the large print because I think, yes, so, so and I think that th that'll be wonderful to kind of survey them and also in connection with, with Edo Japan to kind of think about them, to really think about their use a little bit more. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a group, perhaps. All right, thank you, Anne and Wenxing. Um, so when did the Cham dance performances start in Mount Wutai? Were they mm -hmm. stopped and then reactivated? Like what are mm -hmm. the dates of these things, these events taking place? Yeah. And also what time of year are they performed? Is it at a mm -hmm. New Year's celebration or a similar ritual event? Mm -hmm. So with the first question, they first started in the seventh. 17th century. So in conjunction with the sort of introduction, the patronage of the uh, of the Manchu emperors uh, on Mount Wutai. Um, and they they were, as far as I know, they were continuous up until the early part of the 20th century. They were they stopped during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and I think they were just only revived like a few years back. Uh, so when I, I think when I first started going to Mount I didn't have them. They were time, I have to, I'm sorry, I don't know. And I can, we can easily look this up when they are performed. Um, and I don't, I don't know off the top, I don't remember. If anyone out there knows, please feel free to write and it I, in. And I can, I can get back to you, it's very easy, <laughs> so, but I, yeah. All right, thank you, Wenqing. So Jennifer, hold on, we'll get you an answer on that. Um, so Joe Ma said, thank you very much for the wonderful talk, Professor Joe. Could you speak more about the significance of using landscape in the background of the Tangkas of Tsongkhapa? Thank you. Mm. So are you talking about this one here? I believe it would be this image. So. Please let us yes. know if it's not. 
<laughs> um, yeah, I mean, they've become a kind of trope. I mean, I don't even know that this is a background landscape. This is more looks to me more like a foreground landscape. If you're talking about the, the, the rocks and the flowers and the trees below, and this becomes a kind of stylized uh, element, a landscape element, uh, speaking also to um, the interest, uh, Tibetan artists' interest in Chinese landscape painting motifs uh, stylized here. And there's a kind of back and forth that goes on right so um so that so we see them in um in 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 um in these these representations um so I, let me know Choma, if you're thinking of something a little bit more specific or this is not what uh you're asking but we can see them here as well this one so yeah so they 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 vary um um, I, I, if anything, they're not, a, I don't think they're referring to Mount Wutai, <laughs> um, or they could be, I suppose, because of this kind of generalized way of looking at these kind of sacred mountains. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. All right. If we have any more questions, please put them in uh, the Q&A bubble. If not, we'll close out in five, four, Three, two, one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, we have one more. Carl got one in. Thank Hi, you, Carl. Carl. <laughs> All right. Nice to see you, Carl. Say by the bell. All right. Carl's question. Oh, he's the okay. answer. He provides answer. the answer. Thank you, About Carl. About Chom Dance. So he Six. said typically, the, oh, would you like to read it, Yuan Jing? Uh, go ahead, please, Julia. Oh, okay. You do so, the um, in, so uh, Jennifer, in terms of your question about the Cham dance, so thank you, Carl. He wrote, typically this dance was performed on Wu Tai Shan on the 14th and 15th days of the sixth month of the lunar calendar. So that typically falls in July as part of a festival, which marks the culmination of a month long assembly for worship and Buddhist teachings. So it would be the sixth month of lunar calendar, usually sometime in July. So Carl, thank you. All right. Any further questions or comments? Going once, going twice. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to start by thanking our wonderful speaker, Wenxing. Thank you again for this wonderful elucidation of the art of representation of Mount Wutai. That was fascinating. I learned so much. Um, we really can't thank you enough for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much, Julia, for, for having me here. It's a pleasure. Um, I would like to say, as a note, our next lecture in the Art, Environment, and Materiality along the Silk Road series will be January 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So that's the same day of the week, Thursday, January 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Our speaker will be Sonia Lee who is Associate Professor of Chinese Art and Visual Culture and the Director of the East Asian Studies Center at the University of Southern California, USC in Los Angeles. She will be speaking on lessons on ecology and sustainability from cave temples of Sichuan. So further information on that talk is forthcoming. So please stay tuned. Uh, to our viewers, sincere thanks for joining us here this evening. We greatly appreciate you and your encouragement always. Once more, I'd like to thank Wenxing and to wish you all a very pleasant evening, joyous holidays, and a wonderful start to 2022. Happy New Year, everyone, and good night. Thank you.